Hello and welcome back to another episode of DNA Live. My name is Jeff Wright. I'm here with Scott Allen. Scott, how are you? Great, Jeff. Good to be with you as always. Thanks. I'm excited for this one, especially I think you and I have both been looking forward to this episode. Uh, not, not many people see behind the scenes, but to have somebody booked uh, four plus weeks out, that's a pretty big accomplishment for us too. So uh, we're very excited about this. And before we get into our conversation with our guest, I just want to say hello to everyone. Um, if you're, you're joining us now live, please say hello in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from. If you're watching later in, uh, on YouTube, please be sure to hit the subscribe button, like the video, and hit that bell so you can be notified. Uh, and if you're listening to the podcast, that's great. We're really trying to get that uh, listenership up. And so please be sure to subscribe to, to the podcast as well. Uh, if you are new to the Disciple Nations Alliance, we want to invite you to check out our website, disciplenations.org. We have lots of resources there for you. Uh, we have ebooks, we have audio, we have video, and we have our blog, which is updated regularly. And we also have our flagship resource. It's called Quorum Deo. It's a free online biblical worldview school. It helps you understand what worldview is, what the biblical worldview is, and how to apply that to every area of your life. In English, it is now uh, rebranded as the Kingdomizer Training Program. That's in a newer, uh, more user-friendly platform that we hope will, will be useful to you on your learning journey. So please check that out. Go to disciplenations.org. And uh, as always, there's a donate button on the top of that page as well. Uh, our work is made possible through grants from foundations and donations from generous people like you, listener, viewer. And uh, we have two, we had two new, new gifts this week. Two new donors joined us, one from Finland. So very excited for that. And, and a brother from Pennsylvania as well. So if you would like to support our work, there's a, there's a donate button. There's an option to become a recurring giver as well to be a sustaining supporter of our work. So Scott, anything you want to add to that? That was so beautiful, Jeff. Honestly. Oh. That was great. Yeah. Why well, did you well, say go Finland? Go Finland. Yes, Finland. Yes. Scott Scott had mentioned that he's going to have to make a uh, a special visit to our new donor. Do some know. donor donor relations. That's Finland. right. All right, Scott, we're excited. We have uh, Sister Monique joining us here. Uh, Monique Dusan, she is the founder of the Center for Biblical Unity. Uh, we'll let her get into her story because I think that's what we're most excited to share with our audience. Uh, but very briefly. Uh, after two decades of advocating for critical race theory, Monique began to see the contradictions of CRT with the historic Christian worldview. She's been on quite a journey since then and has founded the Center for Biblical Unity uh, with a vision to promote racial healing based on the historic Christian worldview. So, uh, Monique, please join us. Hello. Hello, Monique. Wait, I have to, I forgot to put my... My set of yes. journey mask on. There yes. it is. Go ahead. One there race, one go. people, one savior. Of course. And that's the Love show. It. There we go. Yes. We know Monique, now. I didn't get a mask. You know, I thought I was going to get something from my little donation I made, but. Uh... Well, well it no. wasn't it wasn't a plus no it wasn't a I'm just joking i'm just joking it wasn't a premium for a donation i had to okay. i had to choose okay. the mask yeah you had to, i got it, it. now monique yeah. don't be nervous i know you've never been live on any social media before <laughs> um you you go live with your podcast partner what once a week twice a week what do you do oh Usually once a week, okay. um, Krista Bontrager, also known as Theology Mom, we go live. We have a podcast every Saturday called All the Things, and it's Saturdays at 6 p.m. Pacific. And we literally talk about all the things. It doesn't really matter what it is, um, any cultural or like relevant issue of our time, but we look at it specifically through a historic Christian perspective. Mm. So we're not bringing in any, anything new age. We're not trying to figure out, well, how do I figure this out? We look at scripture first and we've had some really good conversations. Mm. And then you also uh, fly solo uh, going live now with the Center for Biblical Unity as well, right? 
You, uh... Yes, I feel like that's like 1.5 of us. So okay. I'm in front of the camera and it's called our family meeting. It's every mm -hmm. Thursday at 6 p.m. And that's where we just huddle around. We get everybody on online and we just talk. People can ask questions. I update on ministry stuff or like how I'm doing. Last mm -hmm. night we talked about something that was pretty controversial this last week. Dr. Shaniqua, Walk I believe it's Walker, ba Walker Barnes. Um, she put out a prayer in a larger volume book mm -hmm. and it the first sentence was dear god help me to hate white people and I so that. yeah yeah so that. we just yeah. sat and we just talked about it from a biblical perspective and people were able to be in the comments and share their thoughts and i would you know respond and address it but really just looking at how do we consider these things from a biblical perspective. Mm -hmm. I say it's 1.5 of us because Krista sits right next to me. Oh, okay. She's moderating she's... in our chat. And then nice. when I don't say something, then she's like, ah, da, da, and then you can hear her like yelling through the mic. So it's 1.5 of us. Nice. Yes. We'll get some stuff on the back end as well, but why don't you point uh, our audience to some ways to find you? So I know, I mean, you can turn on notifications on Facebook and when Monique goes live at 6 p.m. on Thursdays, you'll, you'll get pinged and she'll be there. Yes, um, I go live else? through through the Center for Biblical Unity. I go live. So okay. Facebook, Center for Biblical Unity. Instagram, Center for Biblical Unity. Our website is centerforbiblicalunity.com. And just come and get connected with the family. I'm on mm. Twitter at the real Monique D for me personally, or the ministry is biblical underscore unity. And I'll also put out a plug for Krista because she's an awesome theologian and you can find her on Facebook at Theology Mom or mm -hmm. on the website at theologymom.com. She does a lot of training um, on how do we really dig into the word. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, she's awesome. Sean's behind the scenes. Good luck, Sean, trying to find all those links right now to put them up as, oh, as we wow. go. Sorry, Sean. <laughs> no, but they'll, you know, we'll get some of those up there. <laughs> and then if that wasn't enough, a semester ago, you decided to go back to school as well right and you're at talbot getting a master's not. no where are I you i am not so i was at talbot i went to okay. talbot in the fall of 2020 okay and i was supposed to start in the spring of 2021 and i just have a lot of issues with some of their philosophies oh and, and approaches to critical theory and i left well I've listened to some outdated podcasts and the About Monique page on Center for Biblical Unity needs an update then too. Yes, so it does. My apologies. Yes, it does. But, uh, no, my apologies. Yes. Well, we, need to, we need to update that. I am currently talking with a school um, about starting and yeah, but I... I'm sorry. Oh, hey, I, let's, I had no, to. I done. had to put put my my faith in in all of everything that I say. Like I never want to. I, I always want, I guess, to walk the walk that I'm talking, Amen. and I don't feel like me being at Biola was, you know, the. I, I don't feel like those things were in step when I was looking at what I was seeing as far as critical theory coming into the campus and mm -hmm. not coming in, but like full force, just like here, here it is. And so we had several conversations, you know, Krista and I together had several conversations about things that were happening at Biola that were really troubling. And so I left, mm -hmm. not, I mean, they know, I know, and everybody's clear. Hmm. I wouldn't mind, you know, I, I know we're going to be digging into this, um, Monique. Uh, I'd love to, you know, I don't in any way want to pick on Biola. My daughter is a graduate of Biola just recently and had a wonderful experience there. And so, and that's part of the reason I was attracted to you because of your Southern California Biola connection. But, um, you know, I noticed that um, I've got my book here by Thaddeus Williams right here. Uh, which is an awesome book. As you know, Thaddeus is a professor at uh, Talbot and, uh, and also uh, he's gotten rave reviews from J.P. Moreland. This is the most important book I've recommended in over 20 years. Well, J.P. Moreland is one of the greatest professors in the United States or, uh, you know, philosophers and he's a biologist. So yeah, I'd love to hear kind of what's happening there, you know, because I think bio is probably indicative of where a lot of Christian universities are. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're not alone. And, and, you know, my heart goes out to Biola to the people who are there. And mm. the, the struggle that I imagine they're in with wanting to keep up with culture with wanting to keep up with funding. Mm. 
and you know trying to figure out well how do we uphold a biblical worldview in all this you know this isn't a uh some kind of harsh condemnation on biola or anything like that it's definitely a call to pray for you know president corey and those under his leadership Mm -hmm. and the reality that this is real and this is what's happening and for me in my walk with god in my conversation with the holy spirit i I didn't think that that aligned for me personally Mm -hmm. wow well said. Well, Scott, why don't we, uh, I think we want to take it back even further, right? So why don't you ask Monique um, to get us rolling to, uh, I don't know if you just want to open the table for yeah, her well, to sh- share, or you can lead her a little bit with. What just we for our do. audience, you know, the yeah. DNA audience. I came across Monique when I was researching for the book that, of course, we wrote on this subject, um, Why Social Justice is Not Biblical Justice. And Jeff and I were both uh, really listening to a lot of people at that time. And we came across your interview, Monique, with, um, oh shoot. Um, Alisa Childers. Alisa Childers. And it was such a breath of fresh air. We were like, wow, let's listen to this woman in Southern California. And, and your story was so compelling to us because of the fact that you, uh, you know, grew up in, in central Los Angeles and uh, went to Biola, were heavily involved in CRT, came out of it. So we were just really fascinated by by your story. And uh, you've been so gracious to, uh, so, you know, we started kind of, you know, pinging you a little bit on social media and you were gracious enough to respond to us. I bought a mask, you know. Yeah, I got masks, yeah. So, and the more that we saw of your ministry, the more excited we got, frankly, we were just thrilled. And so um, you've been a huge blessing to us more than you realize. But yeah, I'd love to, you know, many folks here probably don't know your story. And so it'd be really great to, to have you just share with us a little bit about your background um, and um, kind of your journey, specifically as it relates to the topic of, of race, critical race theory, um, but but you can go as broadly as you'd like. So, yeah. Sure. Well, yeah. I was born and raised in South Los Angeles. I was there until I was about 15, 16. And then I moved to North Hollywood, which is just a suburb of Los Angeles, north of Hollywood. That's the name. And raised by a single parent. I have two sisters and a brother. So there were four kids all together. And I was in Los Angeles during, I feel like a a very volatile time in LA's history or recent history. Um, There was the killing of, gosh, I believe her name was Latasha Harlins. Um, She was a young girl killed about a mile, mile and a half from my house by a Korean Mm -hmm. liquor store owner. She -hmm. was, you know, grabbing for, I want to say grabbing for like her wallet or something to pay for some juice. And the Korean liquor store owner shot her, you know, in the middle of this process. And then there was the Rodney King incident and then the Rodney King verdicts and things like that, that sparked the LA riots. And so I lived in Los Angeles right during all of that. I remember, you know, people looting and rioting, like, right, I can see it right from my block. And so, you, know, so you were, excuse me, you were right in the middle of that then. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Reginald Denny was beaten on um, Florence and maybe Florence in Normandy. Yeah. Florence in Normandy. Oh. And mm-hmm. I was maybe, I was like the street light before that at like near Florence and Gage. Mm-hmm. And so not, I mean, in case anybody's watching who knows these landmarks, but yeah. Yeah. I was, I was oh, there. Yeah. And, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> and so it, it was just a different time. And, but the conversation was very much around like this black and white issue Mm -hmm. and how white people treat black people and the things that black people experience were were experiencing currently and had experienced. And this is why black people were so upset. And this is why we were rioting and looting and they, you know, black people just weren't going to take it anymore. And white people think they can do black people any kind of way. And so there was all of this going on in my young mind, trying to, to figure out, you know, what's happening. And, and at the same time, though, I had a heart built or bent toward justice, toward social service just, I think, in organically, you know, Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to either work with orphans or children in foster care and things like that. And Mm -hmm. so, 
you know, I am trying to process all of this in my mind at the same time. Meanwhile, we moved to North Hollywood. Those thoughts don't go away. I'm just now in a different area. Um, I end up, you know, going to like a junior college for, um, for a while. And then I transfer into Biola and it was very different up until my time at Biola. I had been in areas that were mainly minority, you know, mm -hmm. so either black or Latino. And, you know, it, it wasn't that it was all that, like there were no white people, but it was highly influenced by black and Latinos. And, um, when I got to Biola, that was completely different. You know, at, at Biola, it was very, very white and, and black and brown students were in the minority and trying to navigate that was very interesting. Now, mm -hmm. the thoughts that I, I had had about like the black and white relationships, about white people, about black people and things that I had heard from like my mom or friends, parents or, you know, whatever, like the street stuff that I had heard when I got to Biola, I learned more of the academic side. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of like pairing my, my street conversations or conversations mm -hmm. that we had had around, you know, the house and things like that with this academic influence. So mm -hmm. for example, you can say, well, you know, white people think that they can treat black people any kind of way. Well, now I'm in academia and you see, well, this is systemic racism, or this mm -hmm. is, these are the issues that have historically plagued people of color at the hands of white people. Here's mm -hmm. the data, here are the statistics. And mm -hmm. so to me, the, the social theories that I learned just made sense. Mm -hmm. There was no reason to question them. There was no reason to question the data. There was no reason to question the interpretation of the data. Um, and from there, I went into a career of social service and I've done nearly everything in social service, especially when it pertains to kids. I went into that with the, with the mindset of helping to get children and people of color to a place where, you know, they don't have to feel subject to, you know, white people, that they can do the things that they want, that they can get an education, they can, you know, break through the glass ceiling and things like that. So mm -hmm. I worked with homeless individuals. I ran a homeless shelter. I've, you know, run groups for kids, created programs and internships. And so I've done a lot. In 2014, I moved to South Africa. I wanted to teach dance and work with kids in um, like movement or dance therapy, getting them in touch with their emotions. And I stayed for four years. I was supposed to be there for a year. I ended up being there for a little over four years. And I came back in 2018. When I came back in 2018, I noticed that there that America was just a different place than, than what I left. Wow. Even though yeah, I had been coming home. You yeah. Know, when you have those experiences of leaving and coming back, you notice changes because I've had that same experience that you don't when you're here the whole time. And there was yeah. a lot of change. I'm just curious about your time in South Africa, Monique. We have a lot of friends in South Africa. I've been many times, love the country. Where were yes. you? Were you in uh, Pretoria, Johannesburg? Where, where, where did no, you? No, I was in Cape Town. Oh, so rough, I, tough for you. Yeah. That's yeah. Pretty. So <laughs> I lived, I lived, if you're familiar with the area, I lived in Stellenbosch and Somerset oh, West. Oh gosh, that's one yeah. of the most beautiful cities in the world. Yeah. It is. But I worked in the Cape Flats. Oh, okay. And so Lotus River, um, goodness, Lavender mm. Hill, mm. Um, Grassy Park, you know, an mm. area that is extremely violent, extremely right. impoverished. Mm. And that was where I did 99% of my work. There's a township up in Stellenbosch called Kayamandi. And I did do some work there. The organization that I was with has a great relationship with that township. But mm. the majority of my work, like I said, was in the Cape Flats at primary um, primary schools and then a high school. So I was in four primary schools and one high school doing work with kids around emotions. Many of them have experienced trauma. Many of the teachers have experienced um, either firsthand or secondary trauma. Mm -hmm. And so just working to be able to help teachers to teach children impacted by trauma, you know, what needs to be done to, to help a child get to a place where they're able to learn. So that was that was my work there, and I absolutely loved it. It um, it ended rather abruptly, but it was still probably some of the best time of my life. Did you go with an organization, Monique, or did you go on your own, or how did that work out? 
So I went with a leadership organization. It wasn't a traditional mission organization. I had mm -hmm. been invited in 2010 to go to South Africa with an organization called Gap Community run by um, Jean Marie Jobs. Mm -hmm. And they do leadership development mainly here in the States, but then they also do mission work in Haiti, Zambia, mm -hmm. and South Africa. And so while I was in South Africa, I also worked in Zambia and Haiti doing work mm -hmm. too, but it's all wow. about you know building leaders. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic, yeah. Well, I, I, I interrupted you. I want to, you know, pick pick up your story again. You said you came back and noticed a lot of changes. I'd love to hear kind of what what yeah your your thoughts on that. What changed? Goodness, it seems like everything changed. It seemed like everyone was angry. I remember being on um, being on an airplane when the when Trump's election results were announced, and this so this had to be 2016, and we were I was flying back to the states. And mm -hmm. the, the pilot came on and um, announced the election results and people lost their mind on the, oh on the airplane. Gosh. People were wow. screaming and crying. It was, oh. and I was like, what in the world? Like, this is gonna be another presidency. The, the mm -hmm. climate that I came back to though was extremely hostile. And mm -hmm. I feel like people were mm -hmm. saying things, especially um, around minority communities and on, you know, like social media, things that we generally only said like in the house or among us, mm -hmm. things that weren't public or, you know, said in mixed company. And when I say mixed company, I mean like black and white or mm -hmm. brown and white. So I, I was quite, you know, taken aback by all of it mm -hmm. and trying to figure out, you know, what happens. What I didn't mention is that I came home from South Africa with mission field induced PTSD. And so mm -hmm. with that, I mean, I'm just like trying to figure out my mental health, but also trying to figure out what in the world, where have I come back to? What mm -hmm. is this? Mm -hmm. wow. And through that, through that, like trying to understand what's going on, I believe the Lord began to take me on a journey. And part of that journey involves my ministry partner, Krista. It involves mm -hmm. conver a conversation I had with an intern where the Lord just began to have, have me have very strategic conversations where I saw that this, this framework, the framework of critical race theory that I upheld and that I feel like is prevalent in culture today was never going to build true unity. We can't get to unity if the if one of our main goals is to shame and blame our brothers and sisters in Christ. Like, how does that build unity? And so through that, like I said, um, the Lord just really began to break down my paradigm. It was a lot of time in the word. It was a lot of time in prayer and just under, understanding for me, what did the, the early church, what would the early church do? You know, like we we're talking past reformation, but you know, in the early church, how would they have handled, did they have these issues? Can I find these issues in scripture? How do I know exactly how to handle these things? And like I said, he just began to take me on a journey. Wow. Wow. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about the lenses you had on before you started this journey? I mean, what does it mean to be living in that swimming in those waters? I think swimming in those waters looks like the reality that all black people are always oppressed. We're always fighting. Mm -hmm. We're always um, trying to get out from under the mm -hmm. burden. Um, the, the fact that, you know, there is, there is a belief that all white people will, you know, always treat black people a certain way or think that they can do us any kind of way. Like that mm -hmm. is literally, um, a thought among many black people. It was a thought in my home for a long time. Like just this, you know, I have to continue to fight. I have to, um, well, I guess the best way to say it is that the thoughts kind of breed a mistrust about all white people. Mm. So then truly, how do I enter into true relationship truly? And while, I mean, while I was upholding this, I would have never said, oh, you know, I don't, I don't trust all white people. Like, well, you know, there's this person over here that I trust or these people over here that I trust. But in reality, you know, as I look back on conversations or thoughts and things like that, I think it was pretty, pretty um, prevalent. I think that I was in a lot of ways just not aware of how deep it was like inside. Mm. Mm. Monique, just on that, you know, I, I, 
I appreciate your saying that this is something you just picked up from really from the culture, from your, your peers and friends and family. Um, yeah, so it wasn't, you didn't come across this through some kind of academic study of critical race theory or reading Ibram X. Kendi or something like this. This was just something you picked up from the culture. Uh, it sounds like, yeah. Yeah, what what I've begun to say, like I think in in understanding some things about the black church and things like that, I honestly look at it now or am considering how this could possibly be true is that it's almost like twins. And so you have critical race theory brewing in academia and growing and living. And then, but then you have the sister or the twin of that in some black liberation theology or, um, you know, just conversations that are had on the street, people's beliefs, the stories that get passed down generation to generation, you know, mm -hmm. all of that. And so they're growing at the same time. They're like twins who never met. And what happened, I personally believe is that, you know, come, February, March of 2020, you have Ahmaud Arbery, then you have Breonna Taylor, you have, um, you know, George Floyd, and the street meets the academia. And mm. now we have something, you know, that is, that's meshed together. That's why I believe you can have a pastor say, well, I've never, you know, I was accused of being a critical race theorist, but I've never even heard of that term. It's mm. because these are the things that kind of just live in the, mm. in the culture and in the conversation and on the street. Yet this is what lives in academia. And so now they're, they've merged together in a way. Tell us about the, the street side of it a little bit. I mean, I, we've done a lot of reading on the academic side, but, you know, you've lived the other side of it. So what were the things that you, had, you were living through and your friends and family members and your peers that reinforced those ideas? There must have been, you know, real struggles, right? It wasn't just all ideas, was it? I mean, these, there must have been real racial struggles, I assume. I think that more than real racial struggles, it's a lot of the story, the narrative that gets passed down. Huh. Um, and, you know, I do have, I have a friend and I remember there was like something that happened in our neighborhood and mm. he was not there. And mm. yet he was approached by white cops and, you know, put on the ground and, you know, all of these things. And then eventually taken off to the police station for something that he had no part in mistaken identity, racism, there, there is a lot to consider with all of that. And I still think that a lot of it comes down to the story and the narrative. I think that a lot of those things get passed down. Like I said, so my grandmother would tell my mom or my grandmother would tell me, or this person knows this. And the, the struggle, especially from those who came out of like the 60s, the 50s and the 60s. And remember that time, those stories were very prevalent and, you know, you can't do this or you should never try that or make sure that when you are approached by a white person that you one, two and three, like, you know, you have this list of things. If you're approached by a white cop, you have this list of things. So, you know, yes, there, there were definite struggles, but I don't know that they were racial struggles. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't grow up with any kind of silver spoon in our mouth by any means, you know, we grew up um, struggling financially. And I would say that many of the people that I grew up with, you know, were in the same predicament. They grew up struggling. And yet I don't know that I can look back and blame a white person for that. I think that there might've been choices that our parents or our grandparents made that created some of the setup and situations that we were in. So yeah, I, I, I don't, I can't like pinpoint and go back and say, you know, all of these things were because of white people. Mm. Do you mind if I, Monica, I, I um, you shared a uh, anecdote in Thaddeus Williams' really terrific book, Confronting Injustice Without Compromising Truth. Do you which, know um, those are my arms on the cover? I'm just going to go I, You know there. what? That's so funny you said this because one of my kids was looking at this cover and they were saying, I think those are Monique's. That's uh -huh. so funny. <laughs> yeah, they got it's it gonna, right. That's yeah. so funny. Just going to go ahead and put that out there. You know, if you are looking yeah. for a good book with good arms. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, if you buy it for no other reason, buy it for those great looking arms there. Monique. I'm that's just right. saying. <laughs> Center yes. for Biblical Unity and Arm Modeling. Yeah. Yes. You know, there you go. I've heard of there hand models of before. Things, though, that if you don't mind, I, I, there was a couple of things that jumped out at me from uh, your, it's called Monique's story. It's just a couple of paragraphs that you shared, you know, as a part of this book. 
uh, that I just wanted to kind of uh, uh, kind of look at with you a little bit more. One was that it, it sounded like God really spoke to you, like there was almost a kind of a miraculous thing here where you were really deep into the critical race theory kind of ideology. It was part of your makeup. And then um, you said here, the Holy Spirit spoke clearly to my heart shortly after I prayed for my family to receive the social justice gospel. And uh, I protested and pouted, but God spoke clearly. Tell us about that. I thought mm. that was really fascinating. Wow. So the family I'm referring to is actually my ministry partner's family. We all live together. Mm -hmm. okay. And so Krista and I had just had a, an argument about race and we had many when, when I was first coming out of this and God bless Krista, because she definitely stayed in the conversation with me, you know, mm -hmm. day after day after day. Mm -hmm. And we had had a hard conversation and I come back to my room and I'm literally just praying like, Lord, can you show them their white privilege? Mm -hmm. Can you show them the spaces where they can go, but I can't and things mm -hmm. like that. And just like that, like it was, you need to repent of social justice. And it was so oh. strong on my heart. It was the only other time, and I haven't shared this too often, but the only other time I, I feel like I've had, I've had um, like a impression from the Holy Spirit that strong is when I was, when I knew I was supposed to move to Africa. Mm -hmm. Like, oh. like just that, like, ugh, this is, this is real. You know, I've had a few of those myself, and I yeah. know what you're talking about when you just really, it's just, wow, that's got to be the Lord, you know, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I didn't know, honestly, what that would look like. I didn't know that it was, you know, a breaking down eventually of my entire paradigm. I just hmm. knew that I had to repent from this. Mm. I, I I still could have repented and been like, but can you, you know, make her aware of her white privilege? I had no idea. I was just like, okay, Lord, and now what? You know, and now uh, what? That must what have been such now? a shock. I can't hardly imagine. Yeah, that. Yeah, you. Ooh, that wasn't. That wasn't. Was you were, you were kind of thinking along those lines. Like, I think I might want to explore. You know, getting out of no. this or something that just came Not out of the at all. Yeah. Not at all. And I mean, it, so much so that even when Krista and I did our first talk together at Biola at the Women in Apologetics Conference, um, there were things we didn't talk about because mm -hmm. I was still holding on to some of the narrative. I had let go of a lot of it, but she was like, you know, we need to talk about this or we need to talk about that. I'm like, no, we can't talk about that because I don't know that that's not mm -hmm. true yet. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it's definitely been a journey. Yeah. I feel like I, I'm, I'm so grateful that we're having this conversation in specifics, but I feel like your experience, even if we spoke in generalities would be so enlightening to people trying to understand the power of narrative and the power yes. of worldview and the, the power of paradigm and the, the lenses you have on, and then in the, the switch of a light, you have a different set of lenses on and you have to, you see things differently and you understand things differently and you remember things in different lights now. And, you know, it's- I, I, I totally so agree with that, Jeff. The, we talk a lot about this in the DNA, Monique, the power of, of worldview, the power of paradigm and how, you know, it almost is a kind of divine thing when people are able to make a shift like you did. That doesn't happen very often. Um, and it's, it, you know, I think there's a place for debate and thought and evidence. And, you know, all of that does, can, that can play a role. But it's, it's, this is, so these are so deep that you really almost need the spirit to do a work, you know. And uh, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it becomes, after a while, it just becomes part of you you don't exactly. realize no, right, that right. you are you know swimming in this water mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. all um you know Jeff when you said and just in an instant your lenses are changed it's like yeah you, the lenses are changed but it's kind of like wearing eyeglasses that don't fit for you mm -hmm. you know your eyes have mm -hmm. be, become adjusted you know mm -hmm. to a certain set of lenses and now here you are with these new lenses and it's disorienting it takes it's a you process know, too it, yeah. it takes its process mm -hmm. and you don't always understand, well, what is this? I can't really make this out. The way I used to read scripture meant something completely different now. I read scripture mm -hmm. from a way that was written specifically 
um, to me. And I will look at, at words and conflate our current cultural narrative with this verse and say, well, this verse definitely has to be for, for this current cultural narrative, instead of looking at scripture as something that was written for me, but not necessarily to me, mm-hmm. you know, looking at, at a verse and not necessarily looking at the history, not looking at, um, at something that's being descriptive versus prescriptive you know it there there's a lot that that had to shift Mm -hmm. for me to be able to truly step into what i believe the lord has called me to well praise god i wanted to pick up again monique if you don't mind just on this um your story here it says uh you wrote i have begun the painful process of untangling my faith from critical race theory it's like prying candy out of a toddler's hands Mm -hmm. i've put up a good fight but God is gentle, faithful, and kind. He walks by my side on a liberating journey out of CRT. That struck me, your, uh, you know, your picture there of prying candy out of a toddler's hand. Tell, help us to see what that, you know, what was, what was so appealing to you about critical race theory or those, that worldview, this set of ideas that made it hard to give up? I mean, what, 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 what was, what was appealing to it? Uh, I've uh, always, uh, I've always been justice oriented. Always. Hmm. Like when I was five, my imaginary friends were orphans Hmm. and I had hundreds of them. You know, I was, I was that kid, but you know, it, there is, there is something about doing justice that my heart just longs for and longs to do. And so one of the things I was afraid of was that, you know, leaving this worldview, I wouldn't, you know, it, it would mean potentially that I would have to view racism as being something that um, never happened, that I would have to basically change my mind. My mind has not changed. Mm-hmm. And I, I know that can sound confusing. So I want to, I want to try and really thread it out. Mm. Yes, my worldview changed. So no, I'm not living in a critical race theory. You know, every white person is a racist. I always have to be on the lookout. I'm not in that that vein. But when I say that my mind is, I guess the job is still the same. I can still, what, what God has put in me and has given me as part of who I am, he didn't erase that. Mm-hmm. Actually, I feel like it's expanded. So mm-hmm. now instead of just speaking out for black and brown people, I can speak out for anyone. Yeah. If I see that there's a justice issue with white brothers and sisters, or, you know, even white non-believers, like I can speak out on that if it's a biblical justice issue leaving CRT, God gave me boundaries so that I can do things biblically. You know, mm-hmm. in, in CRT, I could I could advocate for abortion. I could advocate for LGBTQ plus issues and still be a Christian in my framework and paradigm. But when I got over here, the Lord said, look, these are the guardrails for justice. Let me show you how to truly do justice the way that I've called humanity and people, my children to do justice because I am just. And so in that, Yes, there are boundaries and guardrails, but the the opportunities are endless and it's endless for anyone. And so that's where I'm saying, you know, yeah, my worldview changed, but what God put in me didn't. I actually feel like it's expanded. I have more opportunities to look in other areas for places to do justice. I was in a very narrow lane for justice. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate you saying that. I think here's what I'm hearing you say, Monique, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when, you know, the CRT is a set of lenses and it, it's about justice, but it frames justice in a particular way. And this idea of, I didn't want to give up my, my passion for justice was this idea that I didn't, yeah, that was the candy, right? I didn't want, you know, I didn't want to give that up. It, it sounds like you realized I don't have to give that up, but I have to change how I see this issue of justice. There's a different way of doing justice, a biblical way that's different from critical race theory. And I just think that's such, if that's, if that's what you're saying, I just think that's such an important message. And it's, frankly, it's part of the reason I wrote my book, because I, um, I've, I too have a passion for justice. And part of the reason that I was so concerned about this is that I saw a lot of justice-minded Christians drifting off into something that I thought was actually leading them towards injustice in the name of justice very often. Um, 
And yet at the same time, we have to recover, and this is where I think we have a lot of work still to do, a biblical approach to, to justice, because the church is kind of still split on this a little bit. You've got some people saying, oh, it's kind of a, uh, you know, it's, it's this whole idea of trying to fight injustice or make the world a better place is kind of a distraction. It's a secondary concern. We need to mostly be about preaching gospel and things like that. And I'm like, no, we have to really put forward a biblical approach. That's our duty, our responsibility, our privilege. And part of the reason that critical race theory, in my view, is prevalent in the church is because we haven't had that robust theology of biblical justice mm. such that people, uh, you know, they see the goodness of that and they don't want this other thing. You know, this just hasn't been there like it should. And so this false thing has come in. Anyways, I'm, I'm well, there's and there's this there's this sort of implication in the in the way you tell the story, too, in that um you needed something in addition to the gospel right you were holding on to crt as as a, an instrument through which to to deal with these these issues i would say so yes yeah. i think that it it just provided a framework and that was for me what was missing in the church mm -hmm. there wasn't mm -hmm. necessarily a framework for mm -hmm. this is how we do justice like you know we can go out and do things like adopt a block and you know clean up a street or things like that but people's lives needed to be truly impacted yes with the gospel and with the the tangible i feel like the tangible things to be able to have life shift mm -hmm. but those things i now understand those things start with a heart that's transformed by the gospel if your heart isn't transformed by the gospel and understanding how god says we should spend our money of course you will you, you'll always be in poverty there are mm -hmm. things that are set up in the scriptures that we understand as we get into the scriptures, but that starts with a heart that's transformed. You know, when, when we talk about doing justice, yeah. one of the things that Krista and I are, like we harp on, is like payday loan places because they prey on the poor. Right. And so how can we go out as a community, as believers, and, you know, impact that system? Because I believe that's a system that preys on the poor. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk mm -hmm. about food deserts or banking deserts and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that now, you know, there are, there are structures in place that have removed banks from certain, you know, cities or urban areas, and yet they've been replaced by a payday loan company. Right. How does the mm -hmm. church speak into that? That's mm -hmm. a justice issue to me because right. the Bible specifically says, don't prey on the poor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, Excellent. Wow. That's so, that's so good. And maybe it's a, a better way to say it would be, you know, don't, don't charge the poor like interest and, you know, all of these things that payday loan places do. I summarize that as like, don't prey on the poor, but yeah. just in case somebody wants to, you know, fact check me and come back for me. Yeah. I mean, I, I we've kind of just in the past 10 minutes answered, started to answer the one question I really wanted to, to get to you because I, I, on Twitter, it was months ago now, and I don't know if you tweeted it or, or you were replying to somebody else's and giving them an amen, but it was, it was something along the lines of, I do not want people to hear me and think, okay, we don't need to talk about these issues anymore. We don't need to talk about racism anymore, right? You could have, you could have started the center for everything's perfect. So let's just keep going and singing hallelujah, right? But you started the yep. center for biblical unity and you call yourself a racial unity advocate because there, there are these issues here, right? So can you, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, why, why did you, um, why is that the calling you've answered? The center for biblical unity and what gaps are you hoping you are helping to fill in, in the church? I'm hoping to, well, okay. So one, I started the Center for Biblical Unity because when I was driving outside of our house one day, it was again, just this huge impression on my heart. <laughs> I was like yeah. the Center for Biblical Unity. I had no idea what it was. Mm -hmm. um, and I held on to it for months. You know, mm -hmm. I mentioned it to Krista and she was like, that sounds like it could be a thing. But, you know, I was like, I don't know what it could be. And I, and I'm, I can be a little stubborn. And so I was just like, you know, no, until we were invited to talk about um, critical race theory at the Women Apologetics Conference. And I wanna say we needed like business cards or something like that. And I was like, well, you know, I'll just 
I can fill out the paperwork for it. And she had already told me you are being disobedient. The Lord has told you something. Yeah, wow. Krista don't play. You got a good she, friend. <laughs> she, she don't play. So, you know, I started not thinking anything of it, not thinking it would be anything, you know, thinking, well, maybe we can go and talk to some pastors about how to do biblical unity. And then, you know, 2020 happened and overnight it feels like we had thousands of people asking us, how do we do this? Such a time as this. Yeah, for, basically. I, yeah. And, and only God though, you know, yeah. like, cause I, Amen. I, I yeah. was, I was definitely stubborn. Um, but you know, the center for biblical unity is exactly what we want to do. We want to be a center for biblical unity. We want to to bridge the gaps where culture is saying that white people need to lament, repent, pay reparations, do all these things. We want to say, no, hold on, wait a minute. Let's look in scripture and see what scripture says for our unity. How do we become unified? How do we walk in unity with one another? What does it mean to be reconciled? Is reconciliation even something that we need to do? Racial reconciliation, something that we need to do. You know, but we want to put this forward first. We don't, we don't want um, culture to lead the way on the, in the conversation of what the church's unity should look like. Mm -hmm. The church needs oh. to lead the way for the culture and say, Amen. this is what unity looks like. We need to be the, the light in the city on a hill that says, you can look to us. We are going to show you the way. In John 17, Jesus prayed and said, you know, I've given them what they need for unity so that the world may know. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so our unity is for something. And so if our unity is for something, we need to know one, what our unity is for, but two, how do we walk in unity? Paul says, keep the unity, Ephesians 4. How do we keep what we've been given? I can't keep something that I don't have. Mm -hmm. So apparently I have it. How do we keep what we've been given? And so that's, that's what we're for. Our, our model is a family model. You know, when we get on Thursdays, we get on the family meeting. It's mm -hmm. a time where we all gather as family and I don't care what your skin color is. You know, and, and well, praise the that's, Lord. Like, that's yeah. the reality. Well, I tell you what, I am so excited by your ministry and your new curriculum, by the way, maybe you could talk briefly about that because you just, you okay. just teased one of the questions you said, do we even need to reconcile? Well, I think spoiler alert by the name of your new curriculum, let's see what you have to say, right? But there's yeah, so many so churches. I know there's a lot of churches here in Phoenix that because, you know, I would say because of the prevalence of critical race theory, but there's just racial tension in a way there wasn't, uh, mm -hmm. you know, five, 10 years ago, it's become really acute. And I think a lot of people are going, what can we do? How do we, how do we be reconcilers? Um, how do we be good Christians in this area of race? And yet what they're doing is they're, they're doing conferences and you using resources from, uh, you know, I don't want to bash anyone here, but Latasha Morrison's books are very popular and her curriculum. And when you look at what she's putting out, it's basically critical race theory, in my view, you know, with a kind of Christian veneer on it, and it kind of grieves my heart. So I, I'm just thrilled that I have now soon something that's an alternative. Well, <laughs> yes. So. I, and I, I, I want you to share that, but I want to ask a question to dig a little deeper on this for, for the benefit, for my benefit, Monique, and for the benefit of our listeners, can you help? I need, I need help discerning unity. I mean, maybe I've spoken to people that don't even realize that we need to discern what kind of unity we're talking about even. Right. I mean, if, if lies are over here and truth is over here and we all come together over here, well, we're now unified, but we're, we're unified in, in lies now. I mean, could you speak a little bit to the discernment? Maybe, you know, challenge to you, have some scales fall off of somebody's eyes in the next five minutes here. What, what do we, what do we, what, what kind of unity are we looking for? What is that? What does that mean? What does that look like? So for me and for the Center for Biblical Unity, we are uniting around the historic Christian worldview. So we are uniting around scripture. We are uniting around our belief in Jesus. We are uniting around what the scriptures say. The scriptures say that we are 
family. This is what we are uniting around. When we unite around the truth of the scripture, there will be things that don't align with culture. There's also going to be things that don't align with other Christians because some Christians uphold a progressive worldview or a progressive Christian framework. Mm. We aren't about that. We want to come together and unite specifically around the scriptures. And when we unite around the scriptures, we truly are united. It, it and, and that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be um, like conversations to be had, right. that there isn't a work to do to keep the unity. Paul cl- makes it clear in Ephesians 4. These are the things that you do to keep the unity that you've been given. So in, in, in gathering around the scriptures, how do we get along? You know, this, this is the question like, okay, so we all believe, you know, this now, what do we need to do to get along? You know, one Mm -hmm. of the things that Paul says in Ephesians four is bearing with one another is basically a going again, go again with one another. Don't Mm -hmm. give up. You're going to have hard times. You're going to have hard conversations. I'm not, I'm not a fool. Like I know that racism exists. I know that people are hard to get, to get along with at times. I'm hard to get along with at times, you know? Mm -hmm. So how, but how do we go again? How does love? Love compel us to go again and to stand for one another, despite the the issues that can come along on the periphery. You know, how do we stand vigilant and aware that, oh, you know what, that's going to be an issue. We're going to need to address that before it truly becomes an issue. How are leaders preparing their flock to be able to go again? We want to do a lot of, you know, topical sermons and, you know, all of these things. We need to just get into, can we just get into the word? You know, mm-hmm. and say, look, we need this is we need to get along. How do we get along? Let's start teaching the practicals of the faith, the orthopraxy. How do I walk this out with you one day after day after day after day? Because that is where our unity is upheld. I don't think that the 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 12 that they just you know got along all the time. No, it took some teaching and some mm-hmm. learning and leaning into to be able to do that. I'm I'm not saying that we're gonna have any kind of you know, super magical formula because the formula that we have in scripture is enough. Amen. Yeah, there's there's a there's a climate in today's society. And I overlap your story a little bit, Monique, in that I left at the very end of 2012 for a year and then 60 months into my first year in South America, I decided to move back as well. So I moved back in 2018 as well. I mm. I resonate with a lot of what you're saying. You kind of watch it from outside the fishbowl, then you just get dipped back in the fishbowl and you go, yes. wait a second. Um, but this climate is, we've elevated um, the, we've elevated, I don't know, niceties, um, get along, getting along over. Yes. Tr- so if I see unity over there, well then I, I, I think that is where I need to go but I haven't taken the step to say, am I, is that unity around something true or is that unity around something, something false? Yes. No one wants to be mean in the church. Right. No one wants to be mean. No right. one and wants to be mean. I don't want to be mean. Yeah. Well, I, I don't mind, you know, you know? Like, yeah. I, I don't mind. I it, it. It's yeah. okay. You know, yeah. it, at, at some point we have to understand, look, I can nice you all the way to hell. Mm. Like that's, that's, well that's just yeah. reality. You know, yeah. if I, if I never say Look, what you're doing, this is sin. Right. Now you can do it if you want to, cause you grown. But the reality is, is that I can't participate like that, that, and this is the problem with this niceness culture is inviting us to agree. Culture is inviting us to participate or actually demanding that we participate And at some point, Christians are going to be seen as being hostile, mean, intolerant, you know, all of these words that no one wants to be called because we are upholding a historic Christian worldview. You know, I feel like culture is saying, well, why aren't you inclusive? Well, the gospel is inclusive. Y'all can all come. Come on. But when you get here, don't think you can stay the same. One. And two, which even goes before that. So I feel like one plus is that you can only come through Jesus. So we are inclusive and yet we are exclusive. Mm. And so, you know, the world wants its cake and to eat it too. Yeah. And that always, that isn't always the option. Yeah. And now if you want me to participate in that foolishness, I can't do that. I'm sorry. And so you might have to label me as being mean. Mm. 
You might have to label me as being, you know, X, Y, or Z. And it's mm-hmm. not that it's not that I am. Well, sometimes I am, but it's it's not that you know I intentionally am. It is that we have different definitions. You're gonna yeah, call right. me unloving, but your definition of love is not based on the historic Christian worldview. Right. Yeah. Well said. If yeah. you smack poison out of my hand, my hand hurts, and you're mean because you made my hand hurt. But you also yeah. just smacked poison out of my hand. Yeah. There it is. I think you're right, Monique. Biblical, biblical, biblical love is re- demands truth. You cannot separate those things, and I think that's what the church has been tempted into today. Yeah, this idea that we can somehow separate truth and 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 just be nice, you know. I I have a question, Monique, because I know we're we're getting close to to wrapping I, up. I say we count five minutes ago as the start of this hour because Monique yeah. is rolling now, and yeah, no, uh, you know we just. Really, really, really <laughs> But um, this is a really personal issue, the, the whole, all that's happening around the discussion of critical theory and race, and it's, it's uh, hitting people in a very, um, it's very personal, it's very close. You know, you have parents that see their kids come back from college, and they've really absorbed a lot of these ideas and are now really challenging their parents, and um, you see the same discussions happening in churches. Uh, you know, as you know, I'm in discussions all the time with people, including uh, a president of a Christian university. I won't mention the name of the university right now, but uh, he's in discussions with his administrator and, and faculty. You know, on one side, you've got people that are kind of drifting in the direction of being woke, and the other side going, they may not have they may not have thought a lot about it, but they know it's wrong. Like this is not right, and and so there's a lot of tension. If you were one of those people let's say you're a parent and your kid comes back from college and you know they've kind of drifted into the direction of this ideology and they've absorbed it how do you what what advice do you have for people to uh to engage with uh, you know on that discussion is there are there is, is there a way to do it that help is helpful are there things not to do any kind of practical advice you would give to people on this i would say start out by praying don't just run into a conversation because you heard your kid say something or your mm-hmm. friend say something like, you know, I'm going to go and, um, and, you know, change my, my square on Facebook to be an all black or black lives matter. Or, you know, when you hear something, our immediate response can't always be that we're shocked and surprised. Like we, at some point we need to understand this is the world that we live in. These mm-hmm. things should not shake you one um even if it's coming from your own child like we need to understand that the enemy is real we have a very real adversary for our souls or to our souls and Mm. so if that's the case then what we need to to do is we start in prayer because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal so Mm -hmm. if that's the case you need to start in prayer and ask the lord lord what 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 should i do like how how would you have me handle this one two um, ask questions. Don't become mm. judgmental mm. And, and condemning. Mm. I can't believe you're going to go support Black Lives Matter and da da da. No, I wouldn't support mm. Black Lives Matter. But, you know, don't come down this, especially with young people, mm. don't come down this judgmental path mm. of you just don't know because you're not old enough. That's stupid. Like, no one wants to, to feel that slander or pressure. And mm. so, start with questions well what do you you know why do you think that you should support this like help me understand like from my perspective I see this can you help me you know tell me why you see something else I would ask well where did you hear that at you know well all black people are being plucked off by the cops they're being hunted okay well where did you hear that at like Mm. because I I saw something else ask them are you open to you know reading something else hearing something else get in the scriptures with people together begin Mm. to just partner with them you know when when Krista was was having these conversations with me and Mm. I was completely against anything that she said we would go for walks and she would just be like, you know, help me understand. What do you think mm-hmm. about this scripture? I'm not really sure, you know, about this or how do you, how do you reconcile that, that thought that you have here with this verse, you know? Um, so there, there's a lot, there's a lot that we as, as Christians can do to adopt a posture of humility mm-hmm. in having these conversations. And even though you may already know the answer, walking that journey with someone will be extremely helpful because you Mm -hmm. may learn something new. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. That's so good. Thanks, That's Monique. so good. And by the way, uh, I love both things. Prayer, you know, you're right. This has to, God has to be working in people's hearts. You know, this goes back to our discussion on worldview. But questions, and again, uh, I know I'm, I keep plugging Thaddeus's book. I should I should be plugging my book, but uh, <laughs> he he frames you got a team for book, that, Scott. He frames this book around questions, and so if you need questions to ask, huh. um, you can go you can go here and get some questions. That's super helpful. Um, I would you know I would off, also offer if you have a young person who's still in your house who <laughs> may not be college ready yet begin mm -hmm. training them in their worldview. I don't mm -hmm, care if it's mm -hmm. like two or three Now you're speaking old, our language, Monique. Or, yeah. Yes, <laughs> two or three years old, all the way up until the day that they leave for college, have a conversation about their worldview, have mm -hmm. multiple conversations about their worldview and conversations mm -hmm. about their identity. Mm -hmm. Raise your kids with a proper understanding of their identity because the biggest question that is facing young people today is who are you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Uh, well, Monique, I'm going to give you, I don't know how hard your stop is, but I'm going to give you as much time as you want right now to tell us a little bit about Reconciled, the new curriculum coming out. And, Reconciled um, is awesome. Yay. Um, gosh, I'm, I, I'm always so flustered to talk about Reconciled. I'm like, I don't know where to start. It's all hey, so cool. safe space, safe Let me, space here. Here we go. All right. Let's see. Um, Reconciled is a curriculum that I wrote in partnership with Krista. She is a theologian. She has two master's degrees from Talbot and she's written um, devotionals and curriculum before. And so I wrote it out like in story form because I didn't know what I was doing. And she took it and literally made it curriculum, mm. which is awesome. The, the entire curriculum is focused on our unity. How do mm. we walk out unity? Um, is this something where we need to do the works of culture? If so, what are those works? Or is it, you know, something that we need to work for biblically? If so, what is the, the call for that scripturally? How do we as Christians go forward in unity? Because culture is telling us that we need to do X, Y, and Z. Culture is declaring that we are not unified. So we really address this, this reconciliation, racial reconciliation and unity. It's a six week format where you go through one lesson a week. Each lesson has... Um, it's like written material. So there's Bible study and teaching material, questions, reflective questions that people will ponder on and answer in group. And then there's a video component of it as well, where I'm before you kind of bringing, bring, um, sorry, kind of bringing some of the cultural issues into the picture so you can see how this is impacting people in real time mm -hmm. or so that you can see how what happens in real time is actually antithetical to what scripture says mm -hmm. the goal of this though is not for you to hear me talk for like some 60 minute sermon or things like that no i'm on there for just a little bit of time because we want you to be able to dig into scripture for yourself to be mm -hmm. able to understand, no, this, is, this isn't, you know, what the scripture says, you know, when we are approached by culture or yes, this is what the scripture says. And this is why I can agree with it. So there's a lot of time for groups to get together and dig in and literally read the word together. Mm -hmm. We go through chunks of scripture because what I'm seeing in a lot of churches is that pastors want to go through, you know, these two verses. No, like we're going to get some context. We're going to look at things and truly dig into why we are um, not just you know, Christians and, you know, united in Christ, but why we truly are brothers and sisters. What does it mean to be family? And so that is our curriculum. It drops on July 31st. It is available okay. for pre-order right now. So you can go and pre-order it. And when you pre-order, you'll get the, the forward. So you'll get uh, the cover and you'll get to see what the cover looks like. And then you'll get the forward. The forward to the curriculum was written by my uncle, Dr. J.P. Moreland. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then you, you will also receive a video teaching that I did on reconciliation. And that's center for biblical unity.com slash center for big center for biblical unity.com backslash reconcile. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, Scott, would you pray for Monique? 
and we uh unless Monique, do you have any other closing thoughts you'd like to share i think we got a lot of your viewers in in the on the live video right now so hello family are there do they have any questions i'm not on facebook i um, uh okay I, I, thought well, we, I believe we shared it on facebook okay i was okay. just wondering if anybody had any questions, not no hard questions. Like, please don't be asking me, you know, things that I can't answer. <laughs> Who are but you I'm wearing today, Monique? Who am I wearing? Yes. Um, it's not an easy you, question. Kelvin far, Klein and, you know. No, I, I'm not. I'm not a big designer. Well, I do neither, like. Neither am I. It was a joke. But I was about to say, because I was like, I went, to, I went to Ross. I think I got this jacket up here, Ross. Um, this this is at Steinmart is, before they closed down. So there yes, you go. Yes, this dress is from Old Navy. This necklace is from Walmart. People, nice. You don't don't be playing no games. Um, okay. Yes, I am ordinary folk. I I'm just one of us. Good, good. All right. Any question? I don't know. I don't have my questions in real time right now. Um, Let me see. But Let man, see you're getting it. some amens, some praise gods, some some preach it, sister. So. Uh, Krista's in there. Krista just posted the link. Thank you, Krista. So there yeah, it is, guys. You, Krista. Thank you. Three for minutes ago. Your faithfulness to the Lord. Dana Fripp, is she a regular family member? Yes, she is. That's my sister. Yes. Hey, Dana. Great. Yes, yes. Um, oh, she just, okay. Krista just posted the, no, she posted this an hour ago. Okay. I, well, I'm saying she posted the link to Reconciled in our comments. Oh, okay. So they yeah, can find it there posted, in the comments. Yeah. She posted the link to your book, Scott. So mm -hmm. there's that. And okay. I don't think I see any comment. Uh, no, not on here anyway. Yeah. You're just, you're All getting right. a lot of. We might have to have you back, Monique, and we can just do a Q and A kind of a thing. I think that'd be a lot of fun. So. Well, let me ask you this. Is there anything that, um, that you guys wanted to hit on before I go that maybe you didn't like any uh, there's uh, yeah we, there was there an hour is never enough time but man I yeah, feel yeah, like no. this was this was rich this was good and if I, I had more right. time I'd like to I'd like to have you respond I just don't think we have time but I'd love to have you respond to kind of the what I call the most common objections that Christians that have been kind of steeped or imbibed critical race theory throw up, you know, how do you respond to some of these things? Uh, things like, it's just a useful tool, right? You know, or uh, I, I don't know, there's so many of these kinds of things that um, when you're talking with Christians specifically, um, you you are confronted, you know, with, with a variety of kind of uh, challenges or questions. So I can answer yeah. that quickly. Um, Leslie Deo asked on Facebook, she says, all of the curriculum and videos are online access only. Yes and no. So you can order the, you you will be able to order the book when it drops um, as a print on demand. The videos will all be through Vimeo. Yes. Um, but the, there's also a PDF component too, if you don't want to do the print on demand. Common objections from Christians that that you know are pro promoting CRT is that the churches didn't want to talk about justice, and I'm like, mm. well, Scripture is clear. Scripture mm. is talking about justice, so find a church that talks about justice, or mm. you get in the Word and have a conversation with the Lord on how He wants you to do justice. But God mm. is just, so mm. we can't get away from justice. I can't get away from the character of my Father. One, mm. um, two, we don't have the credentials to talk about it. I upheld the worldview for you know 20 years, but you know I don't have the credentials, so I think that's that's a big one. I don't have a PhD in sociology. Right, um, right, right. The the fact that you know, well, it's not a worldview; it's an analytical tool. That's right. cool. I can actually get on board with that it it but here's the thing it answers so many worldview questions that it people don't know how to sparse it out so if i'm not in academia with my phd sitting in you know my college classroom or my college office i am now putting on the lenses of critical race theory and i am moved into activism and and doing these things as a uh, a physical component i also look at you know people like ibram kendi and say well you know if this is only an analytical tool then what is all of the call to become this way or this type mm. of person an analytical tool is something that i looked at. it's kind of like a, a protractor mm -hmm. you know i don't need to become math in order to use a protractor i don't need to become this other thing or person yet when i look at crt in order for me to to 
actualize the results or actualize the the results like yeah the results of crt or, or the goals I, I should say i have to become something else i need mm. to become anti-racist i need to become a social justice advocate or a social justice warrior so the framework Yes, it is a framework and it should sit in academia and it can and it can highlight like there are places of overlap within mm -hmm. Christianity and within the critical race theory um, analytical tool as a framework. There are places of overlap. I completely agree that race is a social construct. Mm -hmm. I do believe that. I do believe that people should be treated equally 100%. Now, that's the tool. But what we see in culture, the use of the tool becomes who I am. Mm. That is the place where I say that it overlaps and tends to become a worldview in the minds of people who don't sit up in your Ivy League institutions mm. just doing analytical research. And mm. this is where it becomes a problem, especially when we try to use this tool within the church. I also say that, you know, and Krista highlighted this to, um, in the beginning is, you know, this tool will promote data and will extrapolate data, but the interpretation of the data doesn't necessarily mean what everyone thinks it means. Mm. It doesn't have to mean that. So how are we interpreting the data through this tool? And is that correct? Yeah, I think another one, Monique, I don't, again, I could, this would be a whole different direction. We could take the conversation, but this is a very common one I hear um, that if you want to enter into a discussion on racial reconciliation, it's really important if you're white to kind of own up to the historic legacy of Jim Crow and slavery and lament uh, and even kind of approach the idea of repent, you know, that you have some moral culpability for those historical sins. Um, you know, there's a lot of that right now. And I think Christians struggle with that, this question of um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly am grieved over the, his, the history of racism and slavery in our country. But, you know, am I morally culpable for that? Is that something that, that I need to repent over? Um, any thoughts from you on how to respond to that? Because I think there, that's a big, big thing we hear a lot. So, To me, what that promotes is the idea that when I come to Jesus and I repent for my sins, that it is not enough. There's an additional repentance that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, if I, and that's, you know, if, if I were white and I was not a racist and did not, you know, never have treated anyone with any kind of ethnic partiality or anything like that, I now need to go back and be like, look, so uh, Jesus, I know, I know you already talked about this, but can you please also extend, you know, this as if when I came to him and said, father, please forgive me. Like his blood didn't cover that. Mm -hmm. I have a problem with that. One, I mean, and two, I just don't see a precedent for it in scripture. I just, I don't, I don't see this precedent of, you know, you are guilty for your ancestor sins in the new Testament anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't see that. And mm -hmm. even in the old Testament, when, when it says like the sins will visit the children down their lineage, those were specific sins. It wasn't, you know, just any willy nilly sin that, well, you know, now white supremacy is part of that sin, you know? So I don't think that we truly have a precedent to call for that. Mm -hmm. um, and oh, there was the, fir the first part of your conversation I was going to respond to and now it's completely gone from my brain. I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah. But yeah, no, I am. Um, I'm not a, a fan of, you know, everyone needs to repent and lament. Oh, um, and when we talk about, <sighs> never mind, it's gone. Sorry. I was going to try. I was going to, I was going to well, try. Well, I'm not going to have you back, because this, yeah, you know, this is a great, great direction to go in. But uh, um, well, your perspective on this is so helpful. And just really thank you for putting yourself out, Monique, to the body of Christ and, uh, and the experience that God's given you. I'm really grateful for that. So. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been good. It's been a good conversation. We can come back and have some more time. Jeff, All I right. need your coat. I'm not going to lie. I need that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the clearance rack at Steinmart and Steinmart isn't around anymore. So uh, I, I need that. You if know. you could. So CFBU, in case you, you're watching out there, CFBU, the headquarters is in my bedroom. And so my bedroom is the color of that jacket. And I love it. All right. One race, one people, and one savior. Yes, that is the truth. That is the declared reality. We are one race, one people, and one savior. I'll I'll pray here, but I All would right. like just if you're a church that 
feels like you want to do a curriculum on racial reconciliation um, and really, you know, get into this issue, I can't recommend highly enough what Monique's put together. She gave me a kind of advanced copy of it. It's excellent and it's deeply biblical. It's mm -hmm. not contaminated with critical race theory. In fact, you know, it, it's helping people to kind of sort that out. So um, just thank you for that powerful resource for the body. Monique, I know God's going to use it in really amazing ways. So thank you. Thank you. Let me pray. Father, I just thank you for our time. God, I thank you for our sister and uh, Lord, for your work in her life. Father, we thank you for our friend, Krista, and her faithful um, uh, friendship and the way that you work through that, God. We just thank you for our friends, Lord, and our family members and the way you work through the body. Lord, I just thank you for, um, Lord, all that you have put on Monique's heart to do. And Lord, I just pray that you would use her and the Center for Biblical Unity in a really profound and powerful way in this really critical time, such a time as this, Father. We know you've raised it up for this time, Father. Lord, if there's ways that we can collaborate, work together, encourage one another, Lord, we just look forward to that and pray that you would bring that about as well, Father. And uh, I just pray that many, many people would grow in um, their understanding of the incomparable truths of a biblical worldview through Monique's curriculum and, uh, and just the beauty and the power of this, Father. There's nothing like it. Um, and we just are so grateful to you, Lord, for, for your love, for your truth, Father. Uh, in the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, if, if you're here with, with us on Facebook right now, thank you so much. If you're listening or watching later, be sure to like and subscribe. Uh, check out the Center for Biblical Unity, centerforbiblicalunity.com. Reconcile drops this summer, but you can pre-order now. Yes, now. Do you have any swag available right now on the website? Uh, ways yeah, to support our, you? Yes, yeah, so you can no. go on our website. You can order face masks, t-shirts, cups, baby right. onesies um at center for biblical unity backslash merch all and, right or just go yeah it's all there it's all there support the center for biblical unity support monique's work and if you want to find out more about the dna disciplenations.org thank you so much god bless